Hi, I'm Nick Schultz of the American Enterprise Institute. I'm pleased to be joined by Indiana Governor Mitch Daniels. Governor Daniels, thanks Hi, for being here. Uh, you were here talking about education uh, today. Welcome to our school. Um, I have a couple of questions for you. I want to build on some of the remarks in, in your talk. Uh, you mentioned uh, people like to talk about spending, overall levels of spending on education. Uh, you indicated in your remarks that higher levels of spending aren't some panacea that are going to make everything work out. And yet, Indiana takes some pride in the fact that of all states, it spends the greatest percentage of its entire state budget on education. So is Indiana spending enough or too much? Or how do you, is there a tension there? I think uh, what that means is that we, it expresses a priority that we put on K-12 education along with public safety. It, we um, have uh, considered it our uh, top assignment and we protected it as best we could. Uh, during the uh, uh, recession and the fall off in revenues, I think Indiana's unique position in funding education reflects not just that, but the fact that we've been very, very aggressive in reducing spending or limiting it in other areas. Not to say they're not important, only that they were less important to us. And um, so it's a combination of those things. Mm -hmm. um, but. Uh, uh, our, our view has been that, uh, yes, more money well spent, it's not always the case, only 60 cents of the Indiana education dollar gets to the classroom. There's a lot of opportunity to rotate dollars out of administration and bureaucracy and into teacher pay and, and uh, classroom uh, facilities and so forth. But um, uh, that uh, more money well spent is a good idea, but it um, isn't the complete answer. We've learned um, that over the course of time. Mm -hmm. America, and Indiana's like this, has uh, more than doubled education spending, but results haven't moved. Well, let's uh, talk about some of the things that you wanted to do that might change the, the results. Uh, you had a very active legislative session and a number of achievements in, in education reform, and I want to talk about a few of those. Um, you discussed that Indiana has, and this wasn't, I guess, part of this <coughs> legislative session, full public school choice mm -hmm. already. Um, and you didn't get a chance to get into the details. I just want to ask you, how exactly does that work? I know a lot yeah. of folks, I have three little kids uh, right. in public schools. It's a very interesting idea that I think a lot of people like to know how that could actually work. It was a second order effect of our, uh, of the largest tax cut in Indiana history. In, in Indiana history. Uh, we lowered property taxes. Uh, they're now the lowest in America. When we did that, part of the uh, method was to uh, absorb at the state level uh, all of school operating costs. Uh, we had most of it at the state level before, but we picked up the rest off the property tax. Now, um, if a student seeks to move from one district to another, as many dollars come with him as uh, would if, if he lived right next to the school of choice. In the uh, old days, the school would charge a tuition for the part of operating costs mm -hmm. that didn't travel with it. So now uh, it is uh, happening in Indiana that students can move from district to district. The district's glad to have them. They get as many dollars as they would have anyway. So the dollars go with the student. That's right. And uh, uh, instantly we began to see public school districts uh, uh, encouraging this and advertising, putting up billboards and sending mailers and uh, describing their course offerings and how many advanced placement tests uh, or, or courses they had and their graduation rates and their test scores and that's a great thing. And so uh, we want to be the state in which every family, no matter how modest their means, uh, has a full uh, set of, of options. The, and we trust them to pick what is best for their child. It might be, if it's not the public school they're, uh, they're, they're nearest to, it might be the public school uh, next door. Or it might be the new charter school mm -hmm. that will be, uh, they'll, they'll be opening in larger numbers. And if, if it's none of those, then it might be a non-government school somewhere. Okay. A big piece of the, the reform, uh, reforms that you pushed through involve, involve vouchers, mm -hmm. uh, so giving more choice in addition to this broad public school choice, but also the potential to have a choice to choose a, a Catholic school or a Jewish school or non-denominational mm -hmm. private school or what have you. Um, as, as I know, you know that voucher programs that have been tried in some places um, 
have been disappointing to some of the early enthusiasts of it insofar as maybe test scores didn't rise as much as people would have expected. Um, does any of that give you, you pause or how, how do you think about that? I'm, th I'm thinking mm -hmm. of Milwaukee in particular, but there, there are other examples of this. In the first place, and just the, literally this, this week there's been another summary of this, uh, the data is pretty encouraging really that uh, uh, families who are somehow offered that choice and take it, that their children do better. Um, so I, my reading of the evidence is very encouraging, but um, setting that aside for a moment, um, uh, I am for this because, first of all, I trust parents to make the choice that's best for their child. I don't think we should be ordering them where their child must go to school. We don't tell them where to shop for groceries. We don't tell them where to get their tires rotated. Uh, but in this one walk of life, if we give them food stamps, which is another kind of voucher, we don't tell them where to go mm -hmm. get the food or what to eat. Uh, so I think we ought to trust people to make this uh, choice. And on most occasions, they'll make the the right one, and there's a social justice aspect to it. Um, uh, wealthy parents uh, are able to move from district to district if they want, or to pay tuition uh, to, to pick a different school, and I don't think that uh, that should be denied to those taxpayers who happen to make fewer dollars. So uh, uh, this gets to a question I had about, about the means testing aspect of, mm -hmm. the, of the vouchers. Now this would strike anybody as fair. It says if you have very limited income, you should get the greatest possible voucher, and it starts to fade out as it moves up the income mm -hmm. scale to something roughly around sixty thousand mm -hmm. dollars or something. Um, I'm wondering if you worry at all about just potential for disincentive effects. Let's say you have a couple, uh, husband makes forty thousand dollars a year. They really want to send their kids to a, a good private school, so the wife decides to take a job making twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars a year, and that's what they want to go do. And then all of a sudden they're above the mm -hmm. limit. She says, I, I don't know, maybe maybe it's not such a good idea to do that. Is that is that an issue that you worry well, about? I do think the greater choice is unambiguously good. Uh -huh. um, but I just wonder at the at this level about any yeah. potential effects. No, it's interesting. I can't say that it would never happen in any case. And maybe we'll learn something. I think each of these reforms that we've past will probably need to be modified as, as the years go by and we discover how they work in practice. But um, what you're really asking is, uh, will people uh, uh, think of this as a higher marginal tax rate on that second job sure. or that, that uh, newer job? And um, uh, it would, if so, I don't think it would be a very strong one. I mean, the difference between the lowest income and the top end $60,000 uh, family uh, in Indiana under this system is going to be, um, oh, uh, a couple thousand dollars. So I don't think it'd be a stopper. If somebody saw a good new job, I think it would be a winner for them still, uh, even, though the, even though the amount of the voucher declined. The, um, another uh, reform that I think is terrifically exciting to a lot of people, and you got a lot of questions about it, at your speech is this uh, sort of anti-senior slump provision where mm -hmm. you can Let's say you're a hardworking student or you're motivated and you can finish high school in, in 11 years, uh, you get a voucher mm -hmm. that can then be used to apply to, it could be a four-year school, community college, vocational ed, or right. some uh, uh, institution of higher learning. Um, is it your sense, of, our colleague Charles Murray thinks that too many folks are going to four-year colleges. Right. Is it your sense that that's the case and, and are you trying to encourage more folks to go into said Indiana has good community colleges. Is that, mm. You think that's how they'll be used? Or how do you see people who want to take advantage of this, how do you see them using it? First of all, anything Charles Murray writes, I uh, <laughs> pay close attention to. And I paid close attention to what he's, what he's written about uh, uh, today's higher ed. And I think a lot of it makes sense. In fact, I bought a lot of the books and gave them to our entire education roundtable, which is a uh, made big committee that advises on, um, on policy. Um, it wasn't, uh, our, our, our approach, the senior year scholarship is uh, neutral or indifferent across those choices and it can be applied equally, as you said, to a four-year school, two-year community school, uh, or some sort of tr training, uh, all, anything that uh, furthers the uh, education and we hope the life prospects of, of young people. And I suspect and I hope that many of them will decide that it, uh, that uh, uh, learning a skill or a specific uh, trade, as, as Charles suggests more, more kids should, is just exactly right for them. Mm -hmm. I'll also point out that if they make that choice, 
that the uh, 4000 or so dollars that, um, that they'll earn by working harder and finishing sooner will probably go further. Um, uh, we go further, obviously, at our community college than one of our four years, and so it, that might lead more of them to explore that option. One more quick question, and then I'll let you go. Um, this was an extraordinarily ambitious set of reforms that you were able to successfully get through, and I know you met resistance on, on mm -hmm. various measures. What were the one or, or two, about, I mean, if you could limit it to one, that were most vigorously resisted, and what does that experience tell you about other governors who want to reform mm -hmm. the system, and, and did anything about about it surprise you? I long since stopped being surprised by resistance to change in education. Uh, the vested interests are very uh, powerful, wealthy, and uh, skillful, and human nature is what it is. And a lot of very um, good-hearted people are um, and very nervous about a system that's been the same for so long, uh, changing in any major way. If I had a surprise by degree, it might have been in the area of teacher quality. Mm -hmm. It was a very strong pushback that this just is wrong to do, that seniority is still the right idea, that there's no fair way you know, to evaluate. And we would ask, well, well, wait a minute, every other kind of professional uh, expects to be evaluated, expects to advance or not based on performance. What's different? And um, uh, but uh, sometimes it was the it was uh, caused by misinformation or disinformation. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to have every school district is, will be in, free to draw up its own evaluation plan. Now it'll have to be quality checked to make sure it's not a sham. But uh, we'll learn from that and. and um, we don't pretend to have the fairest system in the model that we've proposed. Secondly, um, that part the parents of, certainly want that. I mean, they want. Uh, I think evaluation. they want that too. Yes, yeah. and the that part of uh, the evaluation that is based on student achievement, and it's only going to be part, um, must be based on the growth of the student. We not only understand, but we embrace the fact that teacher cannot control who comes in the classroom and, and uh, some teachers will uh, be assigned a class of kids who really are behind and that's exactly the teacher if she or he is successful in growing and advancing and catching up that student that's exactly the teacher we want to identify and shower recognition and higher pay on. Thank you so much for yeah, taking sure. time Thanks, to talk Nick. to us. I Always appreciate fun. it.